So you kids are dismissed. Uh, The rest of us, uh, we're going to be picking up in Luke chapter 4. And uh, last week we had read about how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, right? Jesus being a human being, right? But also at the same time fully God, uh, his human part of him encountered temptation. But just because he was tempted did not mean that he stumbled nor failed. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. And so Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I do not. Uh, And as a result, Jesus was able to be the, the sacrifice in our place for our sins, right? That he was able to be the innocent one who took on the consequences that were deserved to the guilty. And that's what Jesus did for us. And what was interesting is that Jesus had gone out into the wilderness right after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, goes into the wilderness as he's led by the Spirit. And when he returns, he returns in the power of the Spirit. And he begins his ministry going out, empowered by the Spirit of God, to accomplish what God had called him to do. And so that's where we pick up today in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says this, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he, he comes to his hometown. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And so notice that Jesus made a practice, a regular habit of being with the people of God weekly to hear the word of God read, to worship with the people of God, right? Jesus honored the Sabbath day, right? If he's keeping the commands of God, that was one of the things that they did in the Jewish community was to to rest on the seventh day. It was a way to recognize that God was the one who had created all things, including ourselves, right? In six days and then rest. Rested on the seventh. And by participating in this community, right, he was discovering, right, and being a part of a community that was worshiping the God who loved them. And so Jesus made that his regular habit. And so verse 17, it says that he, he gets up to read, and so we are a people of God's word, right, just like they were, that we regularly gather to hear God's word read aloud, and it's the word of God that is mighty and powerful, that's sharper than any two-edged sword, right, that pierces in our hearts and separates soul and spirit and divides joint and marrow and can let us know what's going on in our hearts, that it identifies our motives and directs directs us and leads us, right? So it's not the ability of the teacher or preacher that is the reason we gather. It's the word of God that it's the words of truth and life that produce change. And so we are participating this morning in a multi-thousand-year-old right uh, routine and habit of God's people to meet and gather and hear his word. And so Jesus did that as well, and he read, uh, it says this, from the scroll of Isaiah. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, so probably, you know, just like I've got to scroll through this, right? He unrolled the scroll, and, and he read what was written. And so from, uh, this is from Isaiah chapter uh, 60. It says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus reads this little snippet of a prophecy written down by Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And he ends up claiming that this was about himself. And so this is actually a summary of Jesus' ministry on the earth. This is why Jesus came. This is what Jesus came to do. And so, right, the first thing he said was, uh, in verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Right? We've already read in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus was full of the Spirit, that he walked in the power of the Spirit. I quoted from another gospel last week that Jesus had the Spirit poured out on him without measure. 
right? And so when we see Jesus' earthly life, we see the way that we as humans should live as, as his followers, right, empowered by the Spirit of God, operating in God's power and not our own strength, right, doing the things that God has called us to do. And so Jesus was full of the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. In fact, in Isaiah 42.1, it says this, another prophecy from the same scroll. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Right? And so Jesus is one who is full of God's spirit. Right? He is full of God's spirit. And the spirit is at work in his life, not just to make him look cool or to do neat tricks, right? The Spirit empowers Jesus for mission, right? To accomplish what he came to do. And so this is what Jesus said, that the Spirit was there to anoint him, to anoint him. And this is like a a bit of a bizarre idea, but there's this theme throughout the Old Testament, this idea of anointing someone. And it literally means to like pour out oil over their head and just like completely saturate them in this oil. There's even like a recipe in the Old Testament of how you make this oil, right? So unusual sort of idea, right? But, but the purpose of these moments was to mark people, to set them aside for the work of God, all right? And so the first people we read in the Old Testament who were anointed were the priests, the people who were mediators between God and the people of Israel, right? So we see Aaron, right? Moses' brother Aaron and his offspring are these priests that are anointed in order to work in this ministry that God had called them to do. And Jesus himself is going to be a priest. He's our high priest, the one and only mediator between us and God who loves us, right? Jesus is the one who, unlike the priests of the Old Testament, would not just make an animal sacrifice to try to cover our sin that we could be forgiven and have access to God, but he himself would be that sacrifice that we could have access to the Father, And these uh, priests throughout these generations, unfortunately, just like all of the other people in the book, failed to keep God's commandments effectively, right? But that's not the way that Jesus was, right? But the priests, they, they sadly, generations would fail to keep the law. They themselves would become corrupt. They themselves, uh, in the days of uh, 1 Samuel, it says that like some of Eli's sons were committing sexual immorality and they would be taking the offerings that were brought to the temple. They would take the best portions for themselves, right? They would just be committing all of these horrible things. And as a result, people felt distant from God. Right? Because of the offense of what the priests were doing, right? it resulted in people just like being like disenfranchised and just being like, why do I even want to participate in this? These people are so corrupt. But yet, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, there's a prophecy that goes out. It says this in verse 35. I don't know if I put it on the screen, but here it goes. It says, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. All right, and so Jesus ends up being a priest that demonstrates and models God's heart and mind perfectly to his people. Right? Jesus is a priest who is not corrupt by, corrupted by sin, but Jesus, as our mediator, is faithful to represent God to his people. Another group of people that uh, we see are anointed in the Old Testament are the prophets. And Jesus is a prophet like Moses. In fact, Moses prophesied saying that there would one day be a prophet better than him and that he should be one that is listened to. And so Jesus, right, made predictions about the future that were fulfilled. Jesus spoke and invited people to, into God's kingdom. Prophets would regularly uh, correct, unfortunately, right, the people of God or even the kings and call them to repentance, to turn away from worshiping false idols and come back into relationship with God. And we see that Jesus is doing that same sort of thing, inviting people back into relationship with him. All right, and, and the, the last group of people that we see that are anointed in this way are the kings. 
All right, we see uh, King Saul and David and Solomon are anointed upon this either coronation type ceremony or in like an indication that they were the next in line, that they were God's chosen to be the king of Israel. All right, and I don't think I need to remind you that the kings failed to do right before God. Right? In fact, uh, even before the people of Israel chose a king, uh, it was prophesied saying, like, when you pick a king, these kings are not going to be for your favor. They're going to take your sons and make them heads of chariots. They're going to take your daughters and make them perfumers and bring them out and, and keep them as maidservants for themselves. They're going to take of your flocks. They're going to take of your fields. They're going to take And in fact, God prophesied and said because it wasn't the right thing for them to have wanted a king when God himself was their king. And he says, you will cry out because of your king and I won't listen. Right? Like, so this heartbreaking moment where the people of Israel reject God and want a king so they could be like the nations around them. And God tells them, these kings are going to take from you and it's not going to be good for you. And Jesus is not that kind of king. Right? Jesus is not a king who takes. Jesus is a king who comes to give. Right? He, has an abundant, he has abundant riches and glory and he pours it out. Jesus became poor that we might become rich. It says this in Mark chapter 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so when Jesus says that he's anointed, he is in fact anointed anointed to become a, a priest and a prophet and king, except he would be an example unlike any of the previous people before him in which he would honor God with his life and with his words. He would not become corrupted with sin as the rest of us have been, right? He would be a king worth following. So Jesus says he's anointed for this purpose, and then he begins to list out the mission, the reason for which he came. He says that he came to preach and proclaim good news to the poor. And as we read the Gospel of Luke, and as you've perhaps read any of the Gospels yourself, you'll see that Jesus regularly is found going out and being among the outcasts of society. Right? He would be out and among the poor and the leprous and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Right? Jesus went to proclaim good news to the poor. P- poor was not just in terms of their economic value, but in terms of those who were the outcasts. And Jesus was one who brought them a message of hope. But that message was not some sort of like prosperity gospel of like, hey, good news, poor people, serve God and you'll be rich. Because that's not actually what he came to tell them. The good news is that even though you've been an outcast of society, you are welcomed into the family of God. Right? That God is making a way in which he's no longer counting the sins of his people against us. Right? That this good news is being proclaimed to the poor. And yes, he still preached this good news towards those who were in positions of political power or religious leaders. But they were often the ones that rejected him because of their own pride, right? They didn't want to submit to his authority or they were jealous of the way that he was attracting crowds or the way that God's power was working through him. Jesus said that the Spirit has anointed him so that he could uh, proclaim liberty to captives, And now, if you think about Jesus' ministry, you won't remember a story of Jesus going and leading a revolt against the Roman Empire. You won't remember Jesus going and, and setting the Jews free or being one amongst the zealots, the rebels that would try to overthrow and and start riots. Right? You might remember the story about Barabbas, who was chosen by the people of Israel on the day that Jesus is crucified when Pilate says, Hey, I will let one of these people go. Would you like me to give you Jesus, your king, or Barabbas, this murderer? Barabbas was one of these rebels that would try to overthrow the government, and the people chose Barabbas over Jesus. Because Jesus was not one who was liberating captives in the way that you would think. Jesus wasn't fighting some political power, right? But Jesus was sent to liberate captives. 
He was a type of Moses. Remember Moses from the Exodus story who went to deliver God's people of over 430 years of slavery in Egypt. But what slavery was Jesus coming to liberate us from? So that's right, that's right, my man. John chapter 8, it said this. This is Jesus speaking, right? So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Right? So they're saying, we're not slaves right now. Jesus, what do you mean you're going to set us free? Right? But Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so this is one of the main reasons Jesus came to the earth. Right was to set us free from sin, not merely for the sake of forgiving our sins, which we needed, but also that we could be free from lawlessness, that we would no longer have to be slaves to it. Right? Jesus doesn't want us as his followers to live a life in bondage and slavery to sin and just be like, thanks for forgiving me, Jesus, but I'll just spend decades of my life as a slave to my addictions. Right? Jesus wants to set us free. And this is good news that he proclaims. Jesus said that he was sent uh, for the recovering of sight to the blind. And what's cool is during Jesus' earthly ministry, he literally performs these kinds of miracles where the blind are able to see. Even those who were born blind and had never seen are given sight. And miracles like this, that God said that this anointed one would come and do, end up being a sign for the many, pointing to the fact that Jesus' message was true, pointing to the fact that Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was. In John chapter 9, verse 16, there is uh, this man that Jesus ends up healing of blindness, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are upset about this because they think Jesus is blasphemous, someone who is declaring themselves to be God. And so they interrogate this blind man. They want to figure out what's going on. Who is this Jesus character? And so this is what happens. Some of the Pharisees, John 9 verse 16, said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. And so they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. And so what's interesting is that even these miracles, yes, although it gives the gift of sight to the individual, does a far greater thing. It exposes to us, makes clear to the public who Jesus is. It allows us to see him for who he is, right? How could someone who is a sinner do miracles like this? Right? This isn't something that happens, that a blind person can suddenly start seeing. And so when we see Jesus do this sort of thing, it allows us to receive him for who he is. Right? That the people who received the miracle or the people who saw the miracle are like, listen, like, I, I think you've got the wrong conclusion about Jesus being this blasphemous individual. How could he do this sort of thing if God wasn't with him? Right? And so Jesus recovers sight to the blind, not just in the physical sense, but Jesus is the one who allows us to see clearly. Jesus came into the world and is the light of the world that allows us to perceive reality as it actually is. That Jesus as the light is the thing that allows us to see everything else in proper perspective, right? Jesus, in fact, even said this in John chapter 3, verse 3. He answered and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That one of the things that Jesus does is he produces so much life change in people that it's, it's as drastic as, as going from not being born to being born and having a whole world opened up to you. 
right? It's, it's so drastic that being spiritually brought to life because of Jesus and what he's done allows us to finally perceive and understand God's kingdom. When before, apart from him, we never would see it, is what Jesus said, right? Jesus himself gives clarity to who God is. He is the image of the invisible God, right? Something that had previously been unseen to us, we now can understand and know and enjoy. It says this in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, right? So when we need to know what God is like, we can consider how did Jesus live? How did, how did Jesus treat sinners, right? How did Jesus treat those who refused to acknowledge their sin, right? How does God feel about humanity, right? And so when, when we need to know what God is like, Jesus is the one who allows us to see that for what it really is. Another thing that Jesus came to do, he said, was to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and once again, you might think like in the physical sense, like, okay, like similar to the set the captive free sort of thing. Except in the New Testament, any time this word oppressed is used, it's referring to one of two situations. Almost all of them are referring to demonic oppression. And one of them is written uh, reflecting on Moses seeing his fellow Israelite oppressed by an Egyptian at the time of slavery. And so when Jesus comes to set at liberty those who are oppressed, he's coming to not set us free from some type of slavery on the earth or from some type of political power. He's coming to set us free and to defeat our enemy, the one who from the beginning was the opposer of humanity, the adversary, the devil, the one who is the accuser of the brethren. That is the one that Jesus is setting us free from that we would no longer be oppressed. And during Jesus' earthly ministry, we'll see a number of times in which he has authority to cast out demons, that peoples whose lives have been so oppressed by the enemy, that have had demonic forces attacking them, making them sick or even suicidal, that Jesus shows up and liberates those individuals completely. That the enemy has no right to stay where Jesus shows up, right? And so we see that Jesus does this throughout his ministry. When he shows up, God's kingdom shows up with him. And he casts out any kingdom of darkness that would stand against him. So Jesus liberates those who were oppressed. And the last thing he said is that he comes to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, older translations say that he comes to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And this uh, requires a little bit of Old Testament understanding to appreciate. It's like, all right, like, man, too bad we didn't live during that year. That'd be pretty cool. But no, what he's talking about is this, is that it alludes to the idea of the year of Jubilee, which is this principle that God had built within the nation of Israel when they came into the promised land. That after, uh, after seven sevens of years, after 49 years, every 50th year, they would have this moment called the year of Jubilee, which was a time of great celebration, and this is why. It had some economic uh, freedom that was associated with it, that any debt was instantly forgiven, that on the 50th year, all debts were erased. It had this other factor that uh, any household, because you inherited the land as described by God, right, if you were an Israelite, and it was designated to your tribe, if for some reason your family had come across hardship and you had to sell your land in order to survive, on the 50th year, that land came back to your family. It came back into your tribe, right? That no one could forever take your land from your tribe. And so on the 50th year, it was this year of celebration in which people had their debts forgiven. The land would come back to their households. And if anyone was a bond servant, a slave of another family because they had no way to provide for their own needs, if they had sold themselves into slavery, they were set free. And so 
God, as though he like set up this entire culture of celebration on this 50th year, right? It seems as though he almost did it merely to point to us, like to give us clarity on how big of a deal it is when Jesus shows up. Right, that we have some capacity to appreciate and understand the freedom and joy and blessings and gifts that Jesus brings with him. Right, like, because this year of Jubilee was something that you would only experience like maybe once in your lifetime. And Jesus' coming to the earth was as big of a deal as that, if not, right, obviously bigger, because he is liberating us. He is setting us free. Our debts are the wages of our sins, which is death, are going to be, right, paid. We no longer have that penalty brought against us. The slavery that we've all become bondage to because of sin, we are set free because of what Jesus has done for us. And so Jesus, it says, verse 20, he reads this passage. It says he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And then everyone's just like, everyone's just like, it says their eyes were, right, fixed on Jesus, right? All the people in the synagogue are just like, what is that guy talking about, right? Like, that's that's crazy. A little side note, because I find this interesting and it justifies, I feel like, some of the ways that I preach. Uh, Jesus didn't read that whole passage, okay? There's more in that prophecy, And in fact, uh, Jesus didn't even finish reading a verse within that prophecy. He literally stopped reading halfway through a verse, okay? And and so, like, maybe you're like, well, what's the big deal, Brian? Well, one is that chapters and verses were added to the Bible later for us to, like, have an address to find things. But also, he was willing to read the passage, just the portion that he needed to communicate what God was doing, all right? And as long as I can, right, read a portion of a passage... And as long as I give it proper context and I'm not twisting it or taking it out of context, right, I feel like I'm allowed to do that as well sometimes. So, like, that way I don't have to, like, read an entire chapter just to be able to say that one line right there was all I really wanted you to know about right now. (laughs) Right, like, so Jesus did that. That means I feel like I'm able to do that as well. But uh, the rest of this passage is interesting. The rest of this verse, in Isaiah uh, 61, verse 2, it says this, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So Jesus stopped like right before that passage got like really hard and heavy and difficult, right? So like, but I think he did that for a reason. Because his earthly ministry, the first time he came to the earth, he wasn't there for the sake of vengeance. He wasn't there to bring justice in that sense. Right? Jesus was one who was bringing good news and healing and liberty and comfort. And so that part of that passage is yet to be fulfilled by our Messiah. There will one day come when Jesus will be established as the judge of the living and the dead. But right, we can enjoy the fact that he offers freedom now. Right, that we don't need to fear that day of judgment because God is love and that perfect love casts out all fear if we would find ourselves in Christ. And so, verse 21, as the rest of the synagogue is still staring at Jesus, he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Right, like how bold is that? So like read a prophecy from the Old Testament and be like, yeah, that one was about me. Right? And not in the sense like we as Christians like to take like little refrigerator magnet Bible verses and like be like, this one's for me. Right? Like, no, no, no. Jesus is saying it even more than that of being like, no, this prophecy is about me and my ministry. Right? This is like incredibly powerful. Like that's bold. That's, that's blasphemous if it's not true. And so he says, this is about me. This has been fulfilled in your hearing. And later on, we'll find in Jesus' ministry that he actually says the whole Old Testament points towards him. Like, he is so bold to say the Bible is about him. And it's accurate to say that. And so verse 22, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. But then some said, it said, and they said, Wait, is this not Joseph's son? And I think they probably would have put that in quotes because... He's the supposed son of Joseph. They knew that Mary uh, had Jesus outside of wedlock, right? Isn't this Joseph's son? Because Jesus is in his hometown, right? And, they said, and he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. 
Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And so uh, they're seeing Jesus speak these words with boldness. They've heard of his ministry and miracles in other villages. And they're saying, hey, wait a minute, but we know this guy. I went to school with this kid. Like, who is he to say he's the anointed one of Israel, right? Like, like wait a minute. Like, okay, okay. Like, and, and then they start to doubt who Jesus is, right? And Jesus ends up saying, a prophet isn't welcome, isn't accepted in his hometown. And then he tells a quick story, quoting from two Bible passages. He says this, verse 25, But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a, uh, to a woman who was a widow. And so Jesus, in kind of referring to the idea of a prophet not welcome in his hometown, he ends up reminding them of this story from the Old Testament in which God sends a famine on his own people because of their own rebellion, because of their worship of idols, right? Because of the evil that they did towards their own people, right? killing and persecuting those who would honor and worship God. That God said during, or Jesus mentioned saying, during that famine, there were people that were hungry. But the prophet Elijah was sent only to an outsider, to a widow in Zarephath, right? This woman who was not of the people of Israel. All right? And so like, that's kind of like a, an uncomfortable story. He's basically saying, hey, the people of Israel, God's chosen people, Many of them were starving at this time, and God didn't meet their needs, right? That's like an uncomfortable Bible passage to bring up. And then he ends up bringing up another one, verse 27. He says, and there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, all right? So Elijah, Elisha, they were right one after the other. And he said, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, and so Jesus then brings up that story that we watched earlier this morning about Naaman, a general of an enemy nation who had victoriously conquered a part of Israel and enslaved those people. And Jesus is saying, hey, remember Naaman, the guy who is all, all y'all's enemy? He's the only leper that God healed in that day. There were people in God's own nation that had leprosy that did not receive healing. But God sought out Naaman, this person who was the enemy of God's people, right? And so Jesus tells these two stories in which it depicts the outsiders as being these individuals who are closer to God than his own family. Like, that's like an uncomfortable idea for them, right? Like, because uh, these people, right, were outside of God's chosen covenant people. The people of Israel were blessed, that God intended on blessing their nation. But if we go back to the origin story of Israel, when God originally had called Abraham, God made his heart known. He says, Abraham, through your family, I'm going to bless the nations of the world. Right? His goal was always to include more people than just the people of Israel. That was always the plan. The purpose of the people of Israel was to point out that even if God gave specific attention and instruction and worked with just one group, that even they would fail to keep covenant with God, right? Pointing out that all of us can't live a perfect life, that all of us can't keep God's commands in our own strength, that all of us need forgiveness, and the good news of the gospel is this, that it is for people who are more than just the Israelites, right? It is for people that, like many of us, didn't come from Abraham's family, right? That this good news goes forth, that we too can be forgiven, that we can be liberated, that we can enjoy relationship with God. And so verse 28, it says, when they had heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. All right, Jesus just said some really offensive stuff against the nation of the people in his own hometown. 
right? That like painted them in very bad light. That said, hey, remember how essentially wicked your ancestors were and you're kind of acting the same way right now, right? So like he, he said offensive stuff, right? And so verse 29, it says, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow, on, uh, brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff, all right? It's like, you guys drag me to Hogback Mountain and like try to throw me off the mountain, all right? Like that's what, that's what happens. So Jesus says this thing that's incredibly insulting, but it's true, all right? That the Messiah is not only going to be the Messiah of the people of Israel, that God has already established a pattern and has the routine of blessing outsiders, right? That, that his focus, yes, is going to be on the lost sheep of Israel, but eventually the message goes forth and he tells his disciples to go into all the world and to make disciples. Go into every nation and proclaim this good news, right? That this good news is for, right, it's good news for great joy and for all people, And so in verse 30, it says this, but passing through their midst, as this angry mob is trying to throw Jesus off a mountain, it's not his time. He is going to die at the hands of an angry mob. But it wasn't that day. That somehow, like, he's just able to, like, pass right through the crowd, right? Like, I don't don't know, (laughs) right? He just walks right through them and, and leaps, right? Jesus passed through their midst and he went away. And so what does this mean for us? When we read that Jesus was, right, filled with the Spirit of God and anointed for a ministry like this, what does this mean for you and I? Because God empowers and equips us with his same Spirit, all right? But we are called to the same types of things. You and I need to hear and believe the good news that Jesus proclaimed, and we need to bring that good news to other people. Right, that you and I bring a message that right, proclaims liberty to captives, that sets people free from oppression, that gives sight to those who previously could not perceive the kingdom of God. And we get to bring this good news, declaring something akin to the year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, in which God is no longer interested in holding people's sins against them, but he offers forgiveness and freedom. This is what it means for us. Right? And this is great news that we get to believe as the followers of Jesus that God empowers us not for the sake of our own glory or our own kingdoms, but he empowers us to accomplish the mission that he sends us out on. And so church, let's pray. But before we do, I want to remind you that for this right, next while, we're just going to have opportunity to, to worship, opportunity to seek God, to dig in, and to pray. If you need to head out, I know many of you have, right, jobs you've got get to get off to or might already have obligations. That's fine. But we just want to periodically make something like this available where we can seek God together. We can pray for our own church family. We can pray for our community. And we can spend time in worship of the God who loves us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and favor. We thank you, Lord, that you seek to save the lost. That, Lord, we didn't deserve the good that you came to bring. But, God, you are one who preaches good news to the poor. That, Lord, we were not deserving of your blessing. We were rebels against you, and yet you invite us into your family. So, Lord, I pray that as we think upon the wonderful gift of salvation that you give, that you offer that we would just be reminded of your goodness, we would be reminded of your promises, that we would worship you as who you are, that we would be empowered by your spirit this morning to go out into this world this week and to be the light that you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.